Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston, and in this video I want to talk to you about super permutations. And actually I want to talk to you about a problem that's a little bit easier than the super permutation problem, okay? So remember, the super permutation problem, it's currently unsolved. We don't know what the length of the shortest super permutation is on six or more symbols. I want to talk about a slight variation of this problem that we do know how to solve no matter how many symbols we're talking about. <laughs> Super permutations are sort of a well-worn topic at this point, okay? Number files done a video about them. Stand-up math's done a video about them. Quanta wrote a nice article about them. So I'm not going to go through all the details about super permutations again, but just to remind you, what a super permutation is, is it's a string that contains as substrings all permutations on n symbols, okay? So for example, if n is 3, if you have 3 symbols, 1, 2, and 3, then a super permutation on those 3 symbols, for example, is 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, because that contains all of the permutations 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, 1, and 3, 1, 2. It contains all six of those three character substrings. Super permutations are tough. We don't know what the length of the shortest one is in general. We know the shortest length when n is less than or equal to 5. On one symbol, it has length 1, sort of trivially. On two symbols, it has length 3, then length 9, then 33, then 153. But then when we have six symbols, the shortest super permutation that we know of has 872 characters. We don't know if there's a shorter one or not. And similarly, we don't know what the length of the shortest one is for any n bigger than or equal to 6. What I want to do in this video is I want to look at a generalization of super permutations called injective superstrings. An injective superstring comes from relaxing the notion of a permutation. In a permutation, you have n symbols and strings of length n, and every one of those n symbols appears exactly once. In an injective string, we instead don't require that the length of the string equals the number of symbols, but we do still require that the symbols in the string are distinct. So for example, if we have three symbols, but we don't look at substrings of length three anymore, we look at shorter substrings that only have length two, but we still require the two characters in those substrings to be distinct, then the question is, okay, what is the largest superstring that contains all of those substrings, okay? So here, the substrings are going to be 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, 1, and 3, 2, okay? There are six of them. And this time, it turns out that there's a superstring of length 7. You can stitch them together like 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, 1. And this contains all six of those injective strings up above, so we call it an injective superstring. We can ask of injective superstrings the same question that we ask of super permutations. We can ask, what is the shortest one out there? And in this particular case, when we consider just three symbols and substrings of length two, it's not too hard to show that this length seven superstring that we just constructed, that's actually the smallest possible. This is a minimal injective superstring. And to see this, notice that in any injective superstring with these parameters, the first two characters cannot possibly contain any more than just one of these injective substrings I want it to contain. And then every single additional character after that can contribute no more than one additional injective substring, okay? So if I want to contain all six of these injective strings as substrings, well, the first two characters contribute one of them, and then each additional character after that contributes at most one more. So I can't contain all six of them until I have at least seven characters total. And well, this is a way to do it with seven characters. Okay, and if we generalize this to other parameters, right, to other numbers of symbols n and other lengths of substrings k, then, well, here's how the counting goes. It turns out that there are n factorial divided by n minus k factorial different substrings that we want to put in this superstring, and each one of them has length k. Okay, so it turns out that we cannot possibly construct an injective superstring that's any shorter than n factorial divided by n minus k factorial plus k minus 1 characters long. Okay, so that's a lower bound on the length of a minimal injective superstring. Now, the really nice thing that happens and what makes this problem so much easier than the super permutation problem is this lower bound is actually attained, okay? It's always attained, no matter what n is and no matter what k is, with one single exception. The only time that it's not attained is when k equals n 
which is exactly the original super permutation problem, right? When n and k are the same as each other, we're just talking about super permutations. Uh, injective superstrings just are super permutations in this case, and unfortunately, that's the only time when this lower bound is not attained. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you why this lower bound is attained and what goes wrong in the argument in the special case when n equals k. <laughs> Okay, so here's how we're going to construct an injective superstring of this conjectured minimal length n factorial divided by n minus k factorial plus k minus 1. What we're going to do to start is we're going to build a graph. And the way that this graph is going to be constructed is the vertices of this graph, they're going to contain all injective strings of length k minus 1. Okay, be a little bit careful here, not length k, length k minus 1. So one shorter than the substrings that we actually care about belonging to the superstring. Okay, and then we're going to connect some of these vertices by edges, and in fact, directed edges. We're going to construct a directed graph here. We're going to place directed edges between two vertices, call them A and B, exactly when these two conditions happen. Okay, so first off, the final k minus 2 characters of the first vertex have to match exactly with the first k minus 2 characters of the second vertex, of the vertex that the edge is pointing towards. In other words, if you were to take the strings on these two vertices, you could overlap the middle k minus 2 characters. In other words, all of the characters except for the first one on the from vertex and the last character on the to vertex. Okay, so if you were to sort of concatenate them overlapping as much as possible, instead of having a string of length k minus 1 now, you'd have a string of length k. You get one extra character because the central k minus 2 characters all overlapped with each other. They're identical. Okay, so that's the first property that we need to have before we're going to put an edge between two vertices. The second property that we're going to need is, okay, forget about those central overlapping k minus 2 characters. You've got a first character that doesn't overlap coming from the A vertex, and you've got a last character that doesn't overlap coming from the B vertex. Those characters cannot be the same thing. Okay, but when we've got these two conditions, we're going to draw edges on this graph, and we're going to get some directed graph out of it. Okay, now this might seem a little bit strange first, because what we care about are the substrings of length k. So why have we labeled the vertices here with substrings of length k minus 1? And the reason is, if we obey these edge drawing rules I just talked about, then you can think of each of the edges, actually, as corresponding to substrings of length k. Each one of these edges corresponds to a unique injective string of length k, and the way that you get it is just by overlapping the two endpoint vertices, their strings, as much as possible. Okay, so now we've got a directed graph where the edges of this graph correspond in a natural way to the injective strings that we want to concatenate as tightly as possible into some string. Now remember, what we want is we want to find a superstring that contains all of these injective strings as substrings. In other words, we want a string that contains all of these edge labels as substrings, and we want to be able to pack those substrings together tightly enough so that after that first chunk of length k, every time we add one new character, we're adding a new substring. We're adding a new one of these edge labels as a substring here so that we get this conjectured minimal length, this n factorial divided by n minus k factorial plus k minus 1. Okay, so in terms of the graph that we've got here, what this means is we want to find an Eulerian path in this graph. We want to find a path through this graph that covers every single edge exactly once, okay? Because if we can do that every time we follow an edge, we can think of that as adding one new character to a string that we're building, and if we're able to follow every edge exactly once, then that's a path that takes us through all of these injective substrings exactly once, okay? So one new character per substring, and we'll get it overall a superstring of the minimal length that we want. And now at this point, we can just fall back on known graph theory results, okay? It's well known when a directed graph has an Eulerian path, in particular, if a graph is connected and every single edge has the same in degree as out degree, then boom, you're going to have an Eulerian path. And well, yeah, this graph has that property. It's not too hard to show that every single vertex has in degree and out degree equal to n minus k plus 1. In other words, every single vertex has n minus k plus 1 edges pointing into it, and also n minus k plus 1 edges pointing out of it. Okay, so because those two numbers match and this graph is connected, fantastic. It's got an Eulerian path. So in other words, yes, there always is 
a way to walk through this graph covering every edge exactly once. And therefore, you can build this minimal injective superstring of that length that we talked about. <laughs> One dangling question, though, is what goes wrong when n equals k, right? Because we could do this exact same thing. We could construct this graph just by, you know, labeling the vertices by substrings of length k minus 1 that are injective, and then doing this thing where we build all the edges. So, you know, what happens in this case? Why doesn't this argument work? Why is the graph not Eulerian? So I can't just build this minimal super permutation of length that's known to be shorter than possible, actually. Okay, and what goes wrong in this case when n equals k is that this graph isn't even connected. So there can't possibly be an Eulerian path in this graph because there's no path that goes through all edges at all, let alone exactly once. For example, if n equals 3, then this graph has six vertices. Okay, those vertices, they're labeled by the strings 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, 1, and 3, 2. Okay, and well, what are the edges? The edges are going from 1, 2 to 2, 3 from 2, 3 to 3, 1, from 3, 1 back to 1, 2, and then also from 1, 3 to 3, 2, from 3, 2 to 2, 1, and from 2, 1 back to 1, 3. Okay, we've got two separate loops is the point. So there's no path that goes through all of them. Okay, and the reason for this, sort of at a high level intuitive reason for this, is because we're so much more restricted. When k equals n, think about what happens when you try to add a new permutation. When you're building the super permutation, one permutation at a time, you only ever have one character that you can possibly add to get a new permutation, right? If you start off with one, two, three, and then you say, okay, I really want to add just one new character to the end of that, to get a new permutation in the string, which will now have length four, the only possibility is to add a one to the end of it. I do one, two, three, and then a one after it. So I've got the permutation two, three, one. And then if I want to add one new character after that to have another new permutation in the string, I've got to add two so that now I've got one, two, three, two, three, one, and three, one, two. Okay. And then this next step, now I'm stuck. Okay, the only way to add one new character so that these last three characters now will be a permutation is if I add a three so that it's one, two, three, but I already had one, two, three earlier in that super permutation, so this doesn't help me at all. I've actually at that point got to add two new characters to get a new permutation in the super permutation. Okay, and with injective super strings, when k is strictly less than n, you don't run into this problem. You can always just add one new character greedily in a way that you know, adds one new injective substring, okay? And the reason for that is because you have lots of choices. There's enough flexibility. This graph has lots of edges. All right, thanks for watching, everyone. That's all I've got for you this week. As always, down in the description, I've got a bunch of extra links to extra reading material if you're curious about this sort of thing. But otherwise, I'll see you next week.